Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And guys, you know, I come back with that second video just to make you think. And this is something that's come out of a movie. You only can say, oh, this is a movie. This is not reality. But guys, I touched on uh, DARPA in my book a little. People really don't understand majority of our technology. I would say 90% of it comes from the military. A lot of people don't really understand that. But right now, the target is the brain, guys, the memory. I forgot what movie it was, but the guy was at a desk, and he asked, what were you doing at this particular time? And they actually pushed on the device and rewinded him all the way back to the beginning of his day. So basically, everything that he was doing was being recorded. And when you look at this video of DARPA, guys, they already have this technology. This is not something they're working on. If they come to you, that means it's already done and it's in the back waiting. So I just want to make sure you understand that. But y'all, enjoy the video. Terrific example of all of that is the smartphone. So all of you probably have one or maybe even two smartphones in your pocket. And you may not know that a lot of the technology that's in the, the smartphone uh, has its roots in DARPA. So uh, Herb mentioned the internet. Uh, GPS, which enables us to find our phones or, or locate where those phones are. The touch screen that's on your phone that enables you to interact with it, that was a DARPA uh, development. Um, the accelerometer that's in the phone that enables you to change the orientation of the screen as you rotate the phone. Uh, Siri, also a, a DARPA uh, technology development. And all of those aspects, again, while they had their roots in national security, came together in this small device and it changes the way that we perceive our world and the way that we interact uh, with our world, okay? Now, what I'm gonna show you today is not the smartphone. I'm gonna show you a new way that we're developing technology uh, to interact with the world for the future. And that's really the technology of the brain. Now, this is an example of one of the, the types of neural interfaces that we're using in humans today. So this is a sensor array. It's about four by four millimeters. And on this sensor array, there are 96 sensors. Each one of the tips uh, uh, on that little array can detect between one and three neurons in your brain. All right? And we have the technology in order to identify those neurons, amplify their activity. There's minuscule signals actually happening in your brain. We can send those signals into a computer, and that computer can interpret what all of those signals actually mean when you're thinking about trying to do something. And we can place these sensors anywhere in your brain or even in your peripheral nervous system. Right? These are the nerves that are outside of, uh, of your brain. Okay, so while you may have thought of neurotechnology, as I've just described to you, as being something way off in the future, it's actually a technology that exists today, and we're actually using it with humans. Now, how did we get here? Okay, so again, I, I'm, I'm telling you about something that you may not be familiar with, but we actually have a history of working in neurotechnology, and it turns out that in the early 2000s, neuroscientists like myself didn't even know if it was possible to read out let's say, 100 neurons of activity in real time from an awake behaving individual. So we started in animal subjects. We said, okay, let's try these sensors out. Can we read out the signals in real time? And can we do something simple like control a robotic arm? And we showed that we could actually do that, just having the animal think about it. And once we proved out that technology uh, in 2005, we said, okay, we're ready to go to humans. Can we place the same technology in the human brain and restore the ability to move and even sense after you've been injured. And I'm gonna show you a couple examples of this. Uh, yes, we could do that. And we said, okay, again, this is DARPA. We tried to push the limits of what's possible. We said, okay, if we can do that for movement and sensation, can we try to do something even more complex? So we went to memory in the human and said, okay, for humans with traumatic brain injury, could we restore their ability to form and recall memories? Again, direct brain interface. Now, here's the one thing that may blow your mind. The kind of questions that we have to go after here are answering things like, what is a memory in your brain? Right? Have you ever thought about what a memory is, what those intricate neural firing patterns actually are, and how you need to interact with them to, in order to facilitate memory formation and recall? That's the scale of the problem that we're actually working on at DARPA. Again, being DARPA, we don't just stop there. We keep moving forward in our trajectory. I actually started a, a new program in 2013 called Subnets, thinking about the subnetworks of the brain, but for the most challenging problem of, of neuropsychiatry, and that's you know, mental states. 
right? Think about depression and anxiety. Think about trying to develop a, a direct neural interface to help people with their depression and anxiety. And again, the same questions uh, are there. What actually is depression in the brain? What are the neurons that are involved in anxiety? Those are the kinds of things that we're ultimately going after, okay? So we have a very long trajectory here, right? Over a decade of work in this space. And what I'm gonna do next, right? So imagine in the future you had a direct neural interface and that direct neural interface gets you off your couch in a virtual way, enables you to explore virtual worlds just through your direct neural interface. And you know, we've got game controllers and cameras to do this now, but it's nowhere near the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. Again, exploring your cognitive space in this virtual world uh, could be transformative. What if you could even connect uh, to your friends all across the globe through your direct neural interface and kind of explore what that would actually be. Okay, so what we're doing today with Doug is just the beginning of what we uh, think is possible in the future. Okay, so the last example that I like to give uh, for you today is in something much more difficult. It's in that area of memory. And as you're getting older and you have a more powerful form of this kind of neural interface and you're feeling maybe a little nostalgic and you want to record some of your memories, Maybe there's a possibility of using a direct neural interface to actually do that. And maybe you use that neural interface to record the moment you went on a first date, maybe the first time you proposed, or even the birth of your child. And then if you even had the ability to share those sets of memories with your friends and family, it could be transformative for how we ultimately uh, live our lives. So, recall back to the examples I gave you with GPS and the internet and Siri. Those all came out of Department of Defense kinds of uh, technologies, but they ultimately came together in a way that changed society. And we think that in the future that neurotechnologies like the ones I just showed you are going to be picked up by commercial entities, right? They're gonna use neurotechnologies in the future. And you know, at DARPA, we create these uh, breakthrough technologies in order to change the future and change the world. That's what we do, that's our mission. Whether it's for a person to try to command and control a, a complex system, or it's a person that has extraordinary injuries and we brought them back to a more normal quality of life. We know that these technologies are extremely powerful, and we also know that they can be used for good or for ill. When I think about an instance that, that really just struck me as, oh my God, we can do this, and that we can do it to anyone, and that we can do it to anyone, was that People at NSA, analysts, can actually watch people's internet communications, watch them draft correspondence, and actually watch their thoughts form as they type. Watch their thoughts form as they type. As you write a message, you know, an analyst at the NSA or any other service out there that's using this kind of attack against people, any other service out there that's using this kind of attack against people can actually see you write sentences in the backspace over your mistakes and then change the words and then kind of pause and, and, and think about what you wanted to say. Pause and, and, and think about what you wanted to say and then change it and then change it, change it. And it's this extraordinary intrusion, not just into your communications, your finished messages, but your actual drafting process into the way you think, into the way you think, into the way you think. 